Shall we go on with our conversation about education still? Yes. As far as one can see, the politicians have not been able to solve any problems. On the contrary, they are increasing more. Nor are the scientists. They are creating the atom bomb and the counter atom bombs and so on, and so on, and so on. Nor the economists nor the social reformers. So what should we do? One sees the necessity of a new society, a new relationship between human beings, which is society. And we apparently, the ordinary people like us, we don't seem to change at all. We change slightly here and there, but not fundamentally. And the world is going to rot, disintegrating. And we seem to be utterly helpless. And we are, we have children who are going to be a future generation. And they too seem to follow our pattern. So what does education mean? Not only the education of our children, but ourselves. What is the whole human life becoming? Where it's all ending up. Should we discuss that a little bit? Silence, or is it general approval? <coughs> Pardon? But trouble seems to be partially that we have so many problems. We have a problem of our child, we have a problem of our wife or husband, we have a problem of earning a livelihood, a problem of our job and how to keep our job. So many problems confront us. So what? We don't know how to concentrate our energies in the essential, or indeed what is the essential. Yes. So we don't seem to be able to solve our own problems. And we're probably heaping our problems onto our children. So where, where do we start with all this? Not surely we can't depend on politicians anymore, including Mrs. Thatcher. No, any of the scientists. So we, it behoves us to start with ourselves, surely, that's the only thing to do. So can we educate ourselves, not allowing time as a factor to change, to bring about a transformation of ourselves, a mutation of our whole behavior. But is there any reason to assume that we can, in fact, improve the world through education? And the past history of the world doesn't make a 
It gives reason for thinking that individuals can change. It doesn't give much hope for thinking that entire societies can be transformed. And so, uh, are we pursuing a chimera attempting to uh, change the world through education? Please discuss it. It was once remarked that <coughs> Germany, before the Second World War, was the most educated country in Good. the world. Yes, exactly. I think the clearly it depends what one means by education. Well, any education of any kind that's ever existed in the world has uh, not, as far as we know, succeeded in making any particular country uh, like paradise in terms of the way people behave. I mean, some have been better than others. But is there any reason to believe in the effectability of mankind as a whole? So is mankind different from you and me? Yes. In what way? I think that when you have a collective, there, there seems to be there seem to be laws that there seem to be factors of collective psychology which are different from those of individual psychology. The, the psychology of mobs is different psychology of individuals who make up the mob. And so there seem to be general rules of collective psychology that uh, mean that somehow the collective is, is different from the individuals that make it up. But is the collective different psychologically from us? Yes, I think so. In what way? I think that the collective, the society, is something which uh, contains sort of social rules a society has rules, but all societies have rules and patterns of behaviour. And we are parts of society, and I think the relation between individuals and the societies they live in, as people have often said, it's like to say the relation between cells and the body that they're a member of. The body is more than the individual cells, and the society is more than the individual members of it. It has rules to tell within which the members, between which they interact. And so I think that there's, there's, there's a distinct difference between human societies and the individuals that make them up. The whole is more than some of the parts. Although, of course, the parts are, are related to the whole and they, there's a relationship between them. What is my agree fundamentally different from the collective greed? Yes. I think that the well, I think collective greed is more likely to be a reflection of uh, uh, individual greed than um, war, the subject we were discussing last night. But there are very few people in, in, on the whole, people within societies don't behave particularly aggressively to other members of the society. But the societies as a whole often behave aggressively to other societies. So it's rather rare for ordinary decent Englishmen to kill other people in England. But it's very common in the last two wars for them to kill Germans or other people in the country to declare war. And this was a sort of social, you could say that it's a projection of individual things, but it's not something that happens within, the, the, the society as a whole seems to have a dynamics which is not just that of the individuals within it. And I think this is a problem that, that a, a, a phenomenon that happens all through nature. Collectives take on laws and properties which are not simply those of the parts that make them up. Is a collective an abstraction? No, I don't think a country is an abstraction or a, a society. It's certainly a word, but I think societies have their own. The fact that anthropologists can study the sort of law, the customs of different societies. Yes, and. Is the individual also an abstraction? I don't think so. Uh, don't you think we have to uh, distinguish between uh, form and essence? I mean, you know, we put together a certain way of behaving, a certain way of dressing, which is temporary and a kind of fabrication between group. And yet, in essence, you know, maybe we're the same. And it's similarly like with the individual. You know, we transfer things to the collective. The collective manifests what we are inside. But, you know, together we, 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 we obey the rules. You know, we put a certain fabricated system. Look, 
if we, if we try to bring it back just to this room, can't we see here as a group of people in the collective, we're demonstrating all the ways in which we as individuals privately avoid the central challenge and the, the essential point? Are we really discussing this matter as a collective in any way differently from the way in which we as individuals consider this matter? Aren't we really continually going about it to ensure that we remain in the same sort of situation day after day? It may seem different, we're talking together a lot of people, but it seems to me that really we're just putting out in the open the way in which we ourselves privately continue to remain as separate individuals with the collective as another idea. You say that that's what we were pointing out in these discussions, Brian, that basically that's what education is, the knowledge that uh, this gentleman, let's say, uh, has, has talked about, about how he feels about the collective mind or the individual. That's part of education, that's the way we're actually told how to think about things. It's sort of implicit in the educational system. That's, that seems to be the point that we seem to be at. And also, what am I to do? I, even if I accept I'm an individual, totally different from the collective, what am I to do? Facing all the terrible things that are going on in the world, what am I? A single, lonely, separate individual to affect this enormous weight of this society. You, if I think that way, it seems so hopeless. Yes. Yes. So I give it up, <coughs> or form a uh, cult, which is also meaningless. Perhaps there may be another approach, what? which is I am not an individual. And one, one step we've been trying to take so, so far is to get clear that there's just one central problem, not a very large number of problems. So my problem is this, a very simple problem. I, I have so far lived as an individual, so far acted as an individual. My relationship with another has been individualistic. My search for truth, for God, whatever it be, has always been individualistic. And I also have the belief that, I, that in me there is God, and that God is looking after me, or I must go after that God. It's all been a limited individualistic activity. And seeing this enormous complex society, with all the horrors that I feel so utterly helpless, right? So I say to myself, my thinking may be wrong altogether. Totally, absolutely, totally, not partially. I mean, I mean, it may be wrong altogether, assuming that I'm an individual and being incapable to affect that. Then I become depressed, hopeless, neurotic, and run away into some institution or some ashram or some other. And that's how I end up. What's the point of it all this? And any attempt to ask how one can help one's children or one's students yeah. while one's still in this sort of. In the same pattern. Is, is doomed to failure or very yeah. limited success. Challenge has me. Well, I mean, maybe that's the fact. I mean, maybe this is just maybe too scary. So, so we can't do anything. Well, we may be able to do something about ourselves and about people we meet. Yes, but that's, that's a very small affair. Yes, but maybe we're very small parts of whatever exists. And, and maybe we have to resign ourselves to this. Maybe this is the nature of things. I, I object to that. I feel such a... such a limited hopeless, self-centred activity, which has no meaning. But it may be true. I mean, the, the question is, is it true or not? I mean, if it's true, one would have to accept it. I do not I question whether it, I agree, I question whether it is true. Mm. Could 
I take up that point which uh, Dr. Sheldrake had made a little earlier, that the individual is essentially different from the society as a whole, and you get new properties coming into existence in the large assembly of individuals. Well, doubtless it is true that one mustn't make always too close a parallel between individual psychology and, and, and mass psychology. Things can come out in a differing degree in these different situations, and as you rightly said, uh, the um, Britisher will not normally uh, seek to solve his problems with his neighbor by murdering him. Uh, and it is more common to do this on the collective level. But this is only a difference of degree, because neighbors do sometimes murder one another. And essentially, I think the situation is not very different. And also, I would suggest that uh, it would be a mistake to um, say that the individual is related to the society in the same way that, say, a cell is related to the whole body, because undoubtedly the whole body and the assembly of cells has totally new properties, which the individual cell doesn't possess. But I don't think you would, I mean, ultimately, in the structure and functioning of the brain, which after all is an assembly of cells. But I mean, if it really were like that, it would be a very different situation, but I think you, would, you wouldn't want to really push that analogy that far. That I think the differences of the way in which the uh, national leaders sit down to plan their foreign policies and the thinking that goes on in their minds it is not really very different uh, from the way they think in their, in their personal lives and the way they have developed as human beings during their childhood. Well, I rather think it is, you see, and I think the idea of the analogy between society and, or and, or and organism is a very old one. I mean, it's, yeah, but it's I don't think it's a good one. Well, I think there's something to say for it, but I think that individuals, I think that these politicians are different. I mean, when they're sitting at home chatting to their friends and family, they're not saying to each other, shall we build more hydrogen bombs in case the neighbors break down our fence or something. They don't think that way. They don't say, shall we pile up more arms because of our neighbors. These are phenomena that they only do in their role as politicians as part of the society. And I think these are emerging properties that aren't just part of the society. I would it suggest this is a confusion. Do this, uh, in normal, but not just politicians, they separate their personal life from their professional life. And this is a typical thing that individuals experience in their daily lives. And I, I think it's a mistake to say the individual is either totally different from society or totally the same but somewhere in between. The, an individual doesn't have so much information as a man uh, who has uh, uh, government responsibilities, and that changes your outlook completely once you're in power. But, uh, sir, aren't we talking about a, a, a basic uh, human psychology? I mean, aren't we talking about the psyche of what is basically in there, which is fear and violence and greed and and, uh, you know, I mean, that, my, my greed, as uh, Doris pointed out, is not different from anyone else's greed. And my jealousy is not different from another human being's jealousy. Basically, you know, the makeup of all human beings is the same. And I yes, think that's you can have, I think when you're talking about education and change, it's possible to conceive of a number of individuals becoming non-greedy or non-jealous or non-aggressive. For a whole society not to be greedy, jealous, and aggressive, you've got to have at least the majority, if not all the individuals, thinking that way. That means that whereas an individual can make a free choice of his own to not to be greedy or jealous or aggressive, if you're going to make everybody like that, and they're also still going to be free individuals. No, but I think you're jumping a little bit. I think you've gone a step. Well, you, you made the jump from the individual greed to the greed of the society. I'm making the same saying that the choice whereby an individual can cease to be greedy, I agree, it can happen. Whether an entire society can be decide not to be greedy without all the individuals or the majority of individuals in deciding not is another thing. You're saying the society is made up of the individuals. Well, I'm not even going that far. I'm saying human beings are basically greedy, acquisitive, self centered, jealous, fearful, and so on. I'm saying that's, that's where I'm beginning, and I'm not going any further as yet. 
I mean, if we start there, then perhaps we can see where we can go from there. If one sees yes. that part. All right, I agree about that. And, but I think that obviously the difference is some people are more greedy than others. But the fear and greed is expressed in foreign policies of, of nations. And this is basically the same as the fear and greed and insecurity of individuals in their personal lives. Yes. Well, that's the important thing. Exactly. Now, moving to the next stage. Um, if one's going to transform a whole society so that it's no longer fearful and greedy, then not only have you got to transform a few individuals within it, you've got to transform most of them. And to transform most in one particular direction, which goes against the normal human nature, which we read as deeply ingrained, to my mind, could only be done by compulsion. And Isn't this a hypothetical situation you're describing? Because we don't actually know what would happen if you had a large group of people who were not greedy. Yeah, we, we don't know. The, the original question came up, is this possible? You see, if it's not possible, if all that can change is individuals rather than entire societies, then um, the, the, the whole discussion starts as to whether this aim to change, change the world or change society is possible, whether society will always be roughly as it has been. Well, suppose we just start with this room. I'm not sure we're actually aiming to change society. I think we've already made a jump there. You see, I, I mean, it seems to me that there's a that, you know, how when one's talking about changing society, is one only talks in terms of an external change. But if we're only talking about changing individuals, then this is a, a different Well, I'm not sure we're talking about changing individuals either. We're talking about education. And education is surely in the business of changing. Well, in, in education, you're trying to see the real significance of greed. <clears throat> what is the real significance of greed? We're talking about whether oneself can change, not about whether we can change lots of people a little or lots of people a lot. We're seeing that the problem is here in me and in you, as it clearly is, as we've, we've established. And we're not going very much further beyond that. We're just saying, now, can that change? Oh, and we're not discussing sort of what sort of education system might make it a bit easier for it to change a little bit. The actual question that's being put before us is, is it possible now? For, for us here today in that room, in, individually, if you like to use that word, for a change to occur. But, but is it just that? It, Christian G said earlier, we live in a terrible world. Um, can we do nothing about it? I didn't say that. <laughs> it will clear up anything about it. No, 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 you, no, you said, can we do nothing about it? And if one can just, I mean, I mean, this is surely not just ourselves, it's the whole situation. But the, the question being put is, if there is a change in us like this, then it may be possible for other changes to come about. But we can't explore that except the speculation. And that's the first step somehow or other occurs, which seems to be where we all continually, constantly stop. So the only really valid inquiry at the moment, this, this hour, seems, seems to me to be, can we change? We can go into what the effects that will have on other people, and the schools and the world and so on, if it comes about, but if, if we putting all our best sense into it can't change, it's obviously possible for us to discuss whether other people can change or we can change other people, anything like that. I think that it's, there is no right answer to this question of what am I to do? Because all the, all of it is, uh, there is no answer to this question, because all the answers we shall give, they will be at the level of the need intellectual or, or emotional or others. And the answer is only when me is not. So to discuss this, all other answers will be from me. And the problem is answer is when when me is not something. I don't think we are talking about a planned change of any kind. That is what seems to be confusing us here. As individuals, we are probably capable of all kinds of behaviors, but there is a sheer constraint placed when we are in a group such as this. I know when I have to say something, I have to think about it, what other people might 
say, perhaps. So as Mr. Nicholson pointed out just now, can I change now? That's the whole problem. And if I do change now, immediately, how will it affect the society? The society which is so corrupt and all the rest of it. What's the point of my change if that remains like that? That's what I'm just taking up that. Does my change in my consciousness change, affect the consciousness of the world? That's all my point. If I accept that I'm an individual and I do change my consciousness with all its content, will it have any consequence? Or it's just a slight transformation of a little mind. But we you don't change. Excuse me. I'm not saying we shouldn't change. No, I'm saying we don't change because it might have an effect on other people. No, yeah, sorry. I'm. What is my relationship to society? And what is my action towards that society? And if I do act correctly, not selfishly, not greedily and so on, will it have a tremendous wave that will cover the entirety of mankind? Or is it just a, a work in the backyard? But Christian G, so long as I'm self-centered, how do I know the answer to that question? I don't, I don't think that's the way it works, really. I, I think that uh, in order, it, the change or the discussion of the possibility of a change comes about from seeing the necessity of a change. What happens to it later on is, in a sense, none of your business. It's none of my business, I agree, but I have a feeling that if I, as an individual, which I, I don't accept that, I am not an individual, and the result of the collective, my greed is the common greed of mankind, my envy and so on, so on, so on, is the common factor of all mankind, psychologically. So I don't think in terms of the individual. So you don't think in terms of society either? No. I think in terms of humanity, whose, whose consciousness is common consciousness of mankind. But you're also, sir, not saying that uh, you are bound by the level of that consciousness. No, no. no. Of course not. <coughs> you, you imply also, sir, that, that if you think of yourself or approach change as an individual, then no real fundamental change will occur. No. Go on, sir. The body is in your court. Yes, you are. I, I, I think, I agree that, that a change in, I think myself, the change in consciousness of one person is likely to affect the consciousness in some in subtle ways of all other people. Now, there's a difference between if you say a change in the consciousness of mankind, this is an abstraction. If you say a change in the consciousness of other individuals, this is, uh, isn't this a different way of saying it? I mean, wh why do you want to use the abstraction of mankind? People. Rather than say other individuals throughout the world. We're all affected by Hitler, Gandhi, Jesus, but we're, we're always being pressurized by all the people around us. Mm. We are that. Yes, but sir, at the same, at the same time, the way Hitler, uh, 
affects this consciousness would, is entirely different than the way this consciousness might be affected by, by a real change in some way. So, which means I have been free of Hitler, all the Hitler, Hitlerian business, I have been free of the propaganda that I make him do, or Christian this. So there must be freedom from all this first. Well, it, it also implies, sir, that, that, for, that trying to see how one change in consciousness will affect other, all the, the whole That comes a little later. Yes. And that Hitler comes might not be a good example. First, I, I do not accept myself as an individual. Yeah, but all right. So if we agree that all the, all these changes in consciousness of people, like Jesus and Hitler and so on, affect the consciousness of other people in the world, which I do accept myself, um, then we still have the problem that does this uh, the consciousness of individuals, uh, or at least of people? I use the word people since we're not into this word individual. Um, uh, is, is, is changed, but we still left with the problem that societies, namely nation states, castes, communities, and so on, all seem to have their own historical dynamics and they all seem to go on according to their own historical laws. And then the people within them, all over the world, are affected by this collective human consciousness. So um, it's society, the human. Uh, people are divided up into lots of different sides, all with different sorts of rules, all depending on their own historical development and their own historical conflicts between each other and other societies. These seem to have a different dynamic that seems to go on almost independently. Yes, sir. But do we acknowledge that the basic psychological content of each one of us is common to all mankind? That's all first. Yes, I acknowledge that. So my consciousness, which is greed, envy, all that, is the common consciousness of mankind. However dynamic, however this or that, it is the common ground on which we all stand. Yes. So moment to admit that, I'm not an individual. No, you are an individual. You are. Your consciousness is the consciousness of all mankind. Well, in one sense it is, and in another sense it isn't. I mean, in, in one, one sense... sense stick to one sense. <laughs> I, can, I can play this ball game back and forth. All right, in one sense, yes, it is. So, as, I'm, as long as I am not an individual, I mean, my whole uh, thinking is different. Right? Mm -hmm. My thinking is not individualistic. My thinking is uh, uh, the common ground on which we stand. If there is a change in one consciousness, a part of it affects the whole. The group consciousness, collective consciousness. Yes, I accept that. If you accept that, then our education is not individualistic education, but the education which is to empty the content of one's consciousness. Greed, envy, fear, sorrow, beliefs, all that kind of collective thing, which is collective. Yes. And is that possible? Well, I think it's possible. I think it is possible, but I don't know if it is possible through education. Uh, I, let's forget the word education. Right. Is that possible for, for this consciousness, which is common consciousness, 
for that consciousness which is now in me, can that content be what? Transformed, not gradually, but immediately. That's the question he has been raising and sticking to that. So am I. Can we also make the implication from that that if that happens, that in turn affects the collective of course. consciousness? Of course. Therefore, a new factor is added or injected into that totality of consciousness. Yes, but it wouldn't mean that everybody else would immediately undergo the same transformation. Well, it might make it easier for subsequent Yes, are people we making to... a mistake to try and make it numerically everybody? I mean, that, that's such an absolute that... Well, we're talking about the collective, we're talking about the fact that we're related to the collective and things affect other people. So, I'm just trying to realise to what extent they affect other people, whether we're talking about... <coughs> I think we can't measure it. Yes, if we can... Well, we're talking numerically, we're talking about it We're also talking qualitatively. It's not just a matter of numbers. We're talking qualitatively about the qualitative change. I know, but what I'm asking is if, if this qualitative change occurs in one person, in a sense it affects other people, other members of the human race. But um, I'm, I'm simply asking the question, in what way does it affect them? Does it affect them as, as making easier the potential for change in them? Um, in other words, would it make it easier for them to undergo the same sort of change? Would they themselves have to undergo it? I mean, it might make it easier for them to do it, lower the threshold as it were, for this change to occur in others. Um, uh, what sort of effect does it have? That's really what I'm asking. So as we came to yesterday, I am, we are a collection of memories. You agree to that? Yes. <laughs> Completely collection of memories. No, we didn't say completely. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? We agreed that we didn't say this completely. Oh, I said partially. <laughs> no, I, I, let's come to a point. I say completely. My tradition, belief, uh, the whole cultural, educational movement is to cultivate memory. And I, when I say I'm, my whole consciousness is memory, you say no, partly, which means there is some part in me or in that consciousness which is not memory. I say, how can that be? And that may also be another memory which I have sublimated. But you yourself refuted that by bringing up the subject of love. Ah! No, 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 just don't go back to that for the moment. I was, I'm trying to find out if the whole of my consciousness is memory, how can one go beyond all that? That's my question. Not I have a part somewhere hidden in me there is, which is not memory. That's the Hindu concept, different Christian concept and so on. There is in me certain clarity of heaven which is guiding, which is helping, which is shaping. Personally, I don't accept that. That's also part of my tradition which has been handed down to me, which is my breaking. The concept so, of it may be memory. Uh, the concept of it may be a memory, but the experience of it may not be. The fact may not yes, be. The fact may how do I know the fact? 
through yeah. memory. No, you can know directly. Huh? You can know directly. Through experience. Through intuition. Or through experience. Mm. Or to experience the most dangerous thing. Mm? One can say there is this inside in me a spot of absolute purity, etc. I can experience that. But that experience is already uh, preconceived. Not necessarily. I mean, it could happen spontaneously. Uh, now, wait a minute. Um, to be spontaneous, you must have freedom. Yes. So, you must have total freedom from all this to have really spontaneous. Well, does the uh, spontaneity override the conditioning, or does, do you have to get rid of the conditioning first to be spontaneous? You see, it seems to me this isn't at all clear how this could uh... <laughs> Please, somebody take it on me. <laughs> I mean, it obviously, it has to happen spontaneously. It can't, you can't, through deliberate action, override all your conditions. Oh. Well, that's clearly another kind of condition. How are you going to start finding out the answers to some of these questions which you are asking? Well, I mean, we were given the answer yesterday. That's the point. Uh, we, we, we came to this point and, uh, yesterday. And then, Is that the same as being given the answer? Well, the answer was, I, I thought the answer was quite clear. That um, the thing that uh, Krishnaji raised that wasn't memory was love. And the, the, this, this seemed to be provide a rather clear answer to something that isn't memory, and yet... So, all right, just let's look at that for a minute. I am memory, mm. and you have told me a love which is not memory, mm. right? You have indicated, you have suggested, you have sh shown me something which is not. Now, how is it possible for this memory to subside, so that the other can be. You follow my question? Yes, I think that's a great mystery. I don't uh, And why do you call it a mystery? Pardon? Did you call it a mystery? Yes. Why? Because the relation between memory, which is the conditioning effect of our own individual and collective pasts, um, and something which is free and spontaneous, it's not clear what the relation between these two things could be, because they're in a sense incommensurate. And therefore, the, the, the relation between them must be a mystery. There's no clear and rational uh, connection between the two. Would you say that if, if one of the two were absent, the other would be? Always one more from the other. Well, I think that, I think that the, uh, my own view, I suppose, is that the creative activity of, of love and so on, as it works in the world, casts off a sort of residue which well, it leaves behind a sort of residue or shell which becomes memory. And I think that in the in the great religions of the world one can see this process happening. So something that starts as a living, free and spontaneous, leading to a, a sort of shell which can easily become an empty shell, which is then part of tradition and so on. <coughs> so that's one relation between the two. I can see how you could get to memory as love. I can't see how you could get to love from memory. That's it. Mm, that's just what But if you could uh, deal with memory in a way that would uh, really elaborate in the active sense in the mind, would that not be like opening a window or letting something else in? Yes, but I don't think that you could actively evaporate it through your own will. Not through will, but is there some other way of, of evaporating it? I think you'd have to just let it come. I don't see how you could actually do it deliberately. And nor do I see how you could do it repeatedly or regularly. It seems to me that most of the time we have to live in the world that we need our members. We may have moments when there's insight. It's not something you can maintain 24 hours a day, or even eight hours a day. 
So we said to yesterday, if I remember rightly, love is of memory. Yes. But I, my whole being is memory. Well, some... <laughs> my whole being is memory. I don't admit there is some spark in me which is not memory. And it's again maybe tradition. So I don't know what that love is. I really don't. Suppose I don't. Then what am I to do with this thing called memory, which, which is me? That's the question. That's. But look, if I start to try to do something with it, I'm back into the same old trap of memory. We came to a point yesterday when you were talking about this. So I go back, go into it. I am memory, and you have told me. Love is not there. So, but I, my whole being is this extraordinary collection of memories, experiences, children, all that. And I may not be able to capture that thing. So I'm only concerned with this. That may be your imagination, maybe just something which is romantic. But I'm stranded with this. You're talking about the other bank, but I'm on this side of the bank. So what am I? What what is the action? What or non-action? Please sit. Don't introduce spontaneity if you don't mind or other. I am here on this bank. And there is no boat to take me across there. So I am stuck with this. What am I to do? Well, I have meditated, I have, I have sacrificed, I have disciplined, I have done every kind of dirty trick I can invent, and I am still there. But I can't move from here. What's that? But I can't move from here if I feel that. If I feel this, that I'm confronted with this realization that this is all I am, and there's no way out because I've tried all the ways out. I, I, I don't admit there is no way out. Not with my usual attitude or way of life. I see that I've tried it for all the ways out, and I find that I, I see that as I am now, there's no way out, and I can't move from here. So what am I am on this side of the bank? Please, it's a simile. Let's good enough. I am on this side of the bank. I have done every kind of thing man has invented to reach the other bank, but I am still at the end of it here. And I ask you, who are all very well educated. Etc. Et I say, please, what am I to do? I have been to all the gurus, all, all those rubbish. I've finished with them. I'm still here. This attempt to get to the other bank is surely a rejection. Huh? It is rejection, the fact that I want to go to the other bank. I don't. I can't. So, I've tried to get to the bank, other bank. All the, all the educated, clever people, the saints, the um, gurus, everybody said, do this and do that and do the other thing. And at the end of it, I am still here. But I don't accept it. What? Huh? I am not accepting it. I am accepting it. I am here. I don't say I don't want to be here. I am there. That you are not facing something that for a moment. At the end of the front.
Friday session, didn't we come to the point where you see that any effort to get across the river or change I don't anything, want, I don't is, want to get rid No, it's part of the same thing that's keeping you there. And if I remember correctly, you said if you remain with that. That's all I'm saying. I am stuck here. I don't know what the other bank is. I can I don't want to imagine the other bank. I'm not even interested in the other bank. I'm here with my sorrow, with my pleasures, with my agony and all the rest of the beastly existence that I live. And I can't I want I would say to myself, what am I to do? Or not to do anything at all, which may be the most positive action. We can't escape that existence. Huh? We cannot escape that existence you just described. This is escape it, sir. We, we cannot, cannot escape, escape that existence. Ah, I'm not I am that. I have I've been through all those tricks. I'm fairly intelligent. I've been I'm stuck here and I say any movement from me is still part of the same old pattern. So I won't move. I don't reject, I don't accept, I don't try to escape from it. It's so, I say, here I am. Isn't there a transforming quality in just seeing it and being with it? Just see that. Doesn't that transform the situation? <laughs> I don't know. What does Please, can we discuss that? Well, sir, it's a very special not doing of anything that you're talking about. But I have done everything. Yes, but the not doing of anything... See, I have come to the point when I say whatever I do is still within the same on this side of the bank. Mm -hmm. So I refuse to do anything. But there are some kinds of not doing anything which is what most of the world does. I am not talking about do I am not talking the world. Just leave the world for the moment. I have done, I have experimented, I have meditated, I have talked about Kundalini, I have talked about this and that and every other kind of rubbish, and I'm still stuck at this end. I'm s you have not answered my question. I'm here. I refuse to move. Haven't I reached some kind of love there? Because I really relate to the rest of the other time, not an individual any longer there. So the government has achieved something already. <coughs> Do I think it would seem to be a great preoccupation with the eye, with with uh, the wish to transform and so is itself a negative thing. I am not my the I am saying on riverbank is perhaps not inclusive enough. We are in life, we are in relationships and yes, I'm, opportunities. I have been through all that. I've been through all that situation. I've altered my relationship with my wife, with my friend. <coughs> I I played all that thing at the end of it all, I see. I'm still here. I'm, I'm not depressed. I'm not hopeless. I am thrown up the sponge. You're not accepting that, huh? Huh? There's no acceptance in that. No. Are we together at that point? That's all my point. I want to come to that. Mm -hmm. Or are we still intellectually playing the game? Or emotionally, romantically say, there's the other bank, how lovely God is looking after me, and I, there's in me, etc., etc., etc. No, politics won't change. They are, those politicians are like me, greedy, power, seeking power, position, all the rest of the ugly business.
It may be, but we are also saying that we are better. I am not saying that. I am part of that whole structure. So I say to myself, I just not move from that position, move in the sense that thought invade any kind of enticement. I don't see what there is to say in the circumstances. I mean, this seems... I don't see any way out of that. Ah, there is a way out. But that means we're all dying to hear what the way out is. <laughs> 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 uh, wait a minute. I refused all the gurus. So you can't make me into a guru. Listen, I should tell you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm dreadfully serious about this matter. but not action. Because we're always acting about that, trying to do something about it. You are not completely discontent in that state? Yes. I'm not trying to run away, I'm not trying to suppress myself, I'm not, I'm not doing... Thought is not... is totally inactive. Because thought has put me on this back. Right? That's the first thing I've realized. That thought has put me on this back. And if thought says again, I want to get there, he's puts. I'm still here. So can, uh, can one remain there without any thought? You understand what I mean by now? Not become vague, say, vegetable or anything, but just without the pressure of thought, without the interference of thought. Gee, the great danger in what you've just said seems to me that it becomes a prescription. Ah, uh, a bit. Is it a prescription? It is the pressure of thought which is really the problem. Interference of thought which is really the problem. Because thought has created this mess in the world. Right, sir? Yes. And the politicians are still working in the field of thought. A thought being partial, their activity will always be partial. Scientists, the artists are all partial. And 
Jesu i že pasu posvod k vsidec oči čez dan, both the beautiful architecture, surgery and all the rest of it, but also psychologically what thought has done, creates such havoc in our relationship with each other. And for thought itself to realize that it cannot interfere. Go. This is a real problem. Go. Discuss. Can thought perceive itself? But you're introducing something. What? You're introducing something. You're saying that there may be something in thought that is in condition, that is in mind. No, no. Okay. My question, please. My question is, I'm just, I'm not telling you, I'm just questioning. My question is, can thought see itself? <clears throat> Be aware of itself. See its movement. So why, why, why is it not possible for thought itself to be aware that as it arises? If it is possible in one direction, why not thought itself? But what sees the anger arising? Is it thoughts which see the anger arising, or is it something else which sees the anger arising? Ah, can't you see, sir? Look. You, you call me a fool, and I can see the reaction, getting annoyed with the world. Yes, but Krishnaji, when you see it, it seems to stop. No, it's not a question of seeing to stop, but the, the very arising, sir. Yes, you can see the arising, but... but uh, wait, wait. What? Arising, that's all I'm asking. Can I... Uh, is there an observation? Is thought, can thought observe itself arising? In the first case, does anger see itself arising? 
arising, or does thought see the anger arising? I'm sure. Detection takes place. Let's take the thought. So, look, when I'm angry, it bursts out, right? Then, a few seconds later, or minutes later, I say to myself, I've been angry. At the moment of anger, I am not aware that I am angry. It's only later. Now, I am asking uh, the arising of anger, not later. <coughs> so, look, you're saying something quite simple. There seem, I, I can't put it into words very well, but there seems to be there seems to be a watchfulness that seems to be very aware of something coming. Are we tremendously complicating a very simple thing? I think maybe we are, Krishnaji, because I suppose we've all had those moments when you realise that thought has been absent. When you realise that, isn't that thought watching thought because it's come uh, up? No, no. Mm. When you say I, I watch thought acting. No, no, not acting. Uh, you suddenly become aware that there's not been you a moment. become aware. Ah, you see. No, I'm not putting it that uh. well. We, I'm assuming that we all have moments. I certainly have had when you, when you realise that thought has been absent. It has been absent. Yeah. But when you realise that, thought is back. Yes. But that that's moment all. of realisation is thought watching thought. So, isn't it? so we but. Go on, explain it to us, you'll see. Well, I you said just now that, I'm just repeating what you said, that you watched thought arising, right? Yes. And you thought, you saw that thought was acting. No, it, it had been absent. It, ha it has been absent, all right. It has been absent, and also at other times you saw thought is active. Well, the, the very moment when you realize that thought had come to an end, it's back. And, yes. and that realization is thought, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, of course. So it, it seems the same as observing anger arising. The observation of thought coming back is thought watching thought. Of course. I'm talking about thought itself per se arising. Is that possible? And the gentleman said it's not possible. It may be. Or, or there is no watcher at all. Now we are thinking in terms of watcher and the watched. But isn't it the same thing? Ah, no, yeah, no, that's an idea still. Is it, is it the totality of thought then, in itself? Huh? Is it the totality of thought in itself, the lady says? <coughs> I don't have to ask, I'll answer it. I'm not, I'm not the only guru here, we're all gurus. <laughs> there seems to be a state of awareness which is not thought. I don't know, sir, but it seems to me that thought is such a fragmented thing that I, I don't see how thought can watch itself. How can a fragmented thing watch, you know, how can a fragmented thing then, watch itself? Then, there must be... Then, sure. Then, I realize I'm memory, hmm? mm -hmm. but not memory. I'm on this side of the bank, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, thought has realized, thought has realized that any movement from it is still to move within the limited area of the bank. Right? Right? Yes, sir. I will come to that yes, point sir. that any movement of thought is to bring back to this uh, memory, to this state, to this side of the bank. So thought itself says, 
I must, there is no, must be no interference. I don't know if I'm making it clear. Are you saying that thought itself has seen that any movement away? Yes, that's all, that's, that's all for the moment, that's all. Is that the same as saying that's a moment of insight? What, sir? Is that the same as saying that that is a moment of insight? Ah, no, let's forget insight for the moment. Sir, I have really... No, no. Thought has realised what it has done. It has built the most marvellous cathedrals, temples and mosques, and all the things in the mosque, in the temples, in the churches. Thought has realised that it has created the most marvellous instruments of surgery. It has also realised the submarine, the torpedoes, the man of and so on. And also it has realised thought is fear, thought is pleasure, thought is suffering. It has thought itself has seen itself in action. Right? Of course this simple one can see this. And, and thought says, I am all that. It may not express it uh, verbally. Thought realises this is me, not the man of war, <laughs> this is me. And so thought says to itself, by Joe I must be absolutely quiet, not interfere. Huh? So that's a tremendous revolution, isn't it? Well, you're making the thought to be very creative. I am creative. It realizes, huh? what is the courage? There is no value. What thought is created is courage. I wonder, sir, if we have realised, if I may most respectfully ask, if we realise the activity of thought, what its immense contribution and its immense danger. Are you suggesting that thought might help us to look at things in a different way? No. <laughs> so, look, Mr. Jenkins, thought has created the instruments of surgery, most extraordinary delicate instruments, right? And also thought has created the submarine. And also thought has created God. The thought that I, in me there is that marvellous state. Thought has also created misery, confusion, division between nations. Thought has been responsible for all this misery. I want to find if one realizes that, not verbally, profoundly in one's guts. There's no way of thought. Huh? I say it sounds to me that in that realization there is the ability for it to stop its continuity. I know. In that realization, Thought itself says, by Jove, is there, if anything I do must be still contributing to that.
So then what happens? Nothing. The <laughs> heart <laughs> <laughs> stops in its track. <coughs> does forgive me for asking you, sir. Does with you does thought stop in its track? Sometimes it does. No, no. Sometimes. It's like I'm being hungry sometimes. But as it stop in your soul tracks it no further. That would include all one's individuality, all one's plans for the future, as well as just the movement of thought, the, the whole of course. thing. Sir, if you once admit thought is partial, because you're born of knowledge, and knowledge is never complete, if you once admit that, it's always partial, then one begins to see its contradictions. Its activity, its, its, its the nature of a beautiful instrument, and also the divisions, the miseries of all. I mean, thought is really responsible for all this. The whole of one's relationship to the world. The world. This is. Thought is not the universe. The whole of my relationship yes, yes, to the world. The whole of me is thought. So it's not just the movement of, of thought which is going to stop in my mind for a moment or two, but it's, yes, it's sir, the, yes, the yes. whole movement of the world as I know it. Yes. Which is going to stop. That is, is there freedom, sorry, is there a freedom from knowledge? Or am I, is my, or am I always working within knowledge, which is memory? What's that? Can I uh, one thing I didn't understand? You said I begin to see. But I mean that would imply this is a process in time. But yes, yes. not to be awkward. I'm trying to understand it. <laughs> Is it possible not to think in terms of time? That is, put it differently, is it possible to end it totally this becoming something. Which is time. Can that end? So to come back, it's education. us to live in becoming. Yes. That's the way education is structured. So for, I know scientists structure. See, let's break, let's look at it differently. Are 
I have a son. I have a, suppose I have a son or a daughter. How am I to help them or see this point where examination exists, big college, university, get it in one direction, to get a job, to get a career, specialization. And also psychologically it's doing the same inward. That is becoming something. Reaching Nirvana, reaching heaven, reaching God, reaching sitting, you know, all that which is becoming, becoming. I am not that, but I will be that. Can all that movement end? Well, thought can only exist in time. Of course. Thought is time. Thought. I mean, do you think that even when thought is, even if one's in a state of thoughtlessness, not thinking, that um, becoming can continue in the absence of thought? I mean, or the sense of becoming can exist in the absence of thought? Sense of becoming, of course, psychologically. Because, so look, I'm violent, I, I will be non violent, which is becoming. Oh yes, but I'm talking about this, this state of if, whether the sense of becoming is itself thought or whether there's a sense of becoming which I'm thinking, for example, to take in, if one looks at animals, many animals are not thinking in any normal sense of the word, yeah. and yet they're becoming, and their entire um, being is, is devoted to becoming. Are they becoming which, psychologically or physically? Well, I think that they, I think they do both, and they grow and develop, and then they um, they carry out a series of actions which are related to becoming in various ways. But is that becoming different from my becoming hmm? not to be violent? You understand my question? Yes. I don't know. That's my question. Huh? I mean, what I'm, I'm I'm, what I'm trying to find out is whether becoming, which is basically within our biological nature. Biologically, uh, yes, I admit that. Yes. And then at a higher level, there's a sort of higher level of becoming, where thought is concerned with becoming, desires and actions and so forth. That's it, that's it. Now, if one goes beyond that, is there an intrinsic sort of becoming that persists even beyond thought? Or does, is, is, um, uh. You see, whether time is merely a conception of time or whether it's something intrinsically built in that somehow will persist even in the absence of thought. You mean, do we go on getting older if we don't think? No. I mean, that if, we, if in the absence of thought we have any kind of consciousness at all, or any kind of... I mean, if it's just blank, then nothing to say. Where did the word blank come from? Well... I mean, this is, we're talking about something, given the fact we're talking about, we have to use words. Oh, no, I'm not talking about being black. No, I said if it's black, then there's nothing more we can say about it. Um, ah, I didn't there's a great deal more to say about it, but, no, no, I'm, I won't go into slum with me, sir. I'm talking of not becoming psychological. Hmm. Yes. That's all I'm talking not anything else. Because that's part of our great struggle, conflict. I must be, I must not be, I, I have been, I should be, and all that. I'm talking in that, in that field only. Yes, all right. Yes, now if I don't, if there's an end to becoming, Is that possible first? 
I am conditioned, I must not be conditioned. Tell me how to be, etc. Et so, is there becoming psychologically at all? Or thought has said you must become that? I don't know if I'm making myself clear. I've always a cause and an effect. I've always have a goal, an end. But if I have no cause, if I have no end, if I have no saying I have been, I should be, if, if I wipe out all that, What? What remains? But clearly, whatever remains can't either be a sense of individuality, or a sense of time, or a sense of becoming, or a sense of going. I, I said, I want to all that. So we can say what what it's not, but I don't see what we can say about what it is, what remains. I think we can morally, I'm just we can <coughs> indulge in description. But the description is not the real. So I mean our mind are always occupied with something, right? Something or other. What happens if there is no occupation? Do I go to sleep? Does the mind go to sleep? And therefore must be occupied to keep itself alive? Or if I if the brain if one sees occupation is just whether it is with Jesus or with cooking, it is the same occupation. Well, it is occupation, I don't think it's the yeah, same occupation. occupation. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm concerned whether it's possible not to be occupied. If one is not becoming and one is not occupied, one still is. Now, what is that? Being is distinct from becoming. Is that being static? Now, this is what thought tends to uh, put on it. So that's a, so. What is that state when there is no becoming? When thought has is in abeyance, as it were, what is that state? I feel that state is awareness. What's that? I feel that state is awareness. Awareness. Just awareness? That's what I believe. I would feel a sense of freedom. Awareness of the whole. Just look at it for a minute. I'm occupied with meditation, with writing, with this, with that. And I say, I'm silly, I won't be occupied. There's no occupation. What is, what is happening? Is it empty?
And we said, what's wrong being, a, being empty? It's impossible. Because one's mind is endlessly going on and on and on. And it seems to be almost going on and on with what? With thought. Oh, well. <laughs> it's not possible to empty oneself. That's why we ask me now if thought could see itself in action. What's that? It's an attainable state, but now we have to ask how long can we remain in that state? And what is the value of being in it? Ah, not how long. <laughs> then we're back. Then we are back. But we are back. We, we can't sure, live in sure. that state. Please. The question is, is how it modifies life in the world. So, a few seconds I had this feeling of complete emptiness and therefore a feeling of wholeness. I don't know if this is right. Please, I'm just. I, I feel empty. Not I feel, this emptiness. And that has the, the appearance or the feeling or the actuality of something whole. It lasts a few seconds, and then I'm back, right? I'm then occupied. I'm occupied with that feeling now. My job had that feeling, that sense of enormity of wholeness, and I like to capture it again. So that becomes my occupation. I, that is, I'm occupied with something that's finished. Now the memory is reviving that, and we are occupied with that. You might then write a very good poem. Huh? So, in the words worthy of description of, of uh, <laughs> poetry being emotional, recollected, and tranquility. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which surely is a worthwhile occupation. He said that over, as far as I'm concerned, that incident of wholeness is gone, finished. I'm not concerned anymore about it. It's, it's a dead thing. But my concern is why is my mind occupied? Is it because if it's not occupied, it's frightened? Because in occupation there is a certain, sec certain sense of security. Suddenly take it away and lost. Just faint. It could also be a habit. I think it can be a habit, of course. Habit. Or it feels my job I'm not occupied, I'm terribly lost, I'm lonely. If all, all those things operate. And aren't most people occupied because they don't want to see what they are? Yes, sir. But we've also said when we're not occupied for at last a second or so, there's this marvelous feeling of wholeness. On the, so when we're thinking of not wanting to be occupied, I mean, it's, it's just a conjecture. Ah, no, no. Well, we're saying on the one to hand... No, to observe ourselves or be aware that we're occupied. But you pointed out the incident just now of not being occupied and there being a marvellous feeling of wholeness. 
when you're again occupied, you, you want to continue this. Yes, yes, yes. But on the other hand, we're also saying we're afraid not to be occupied. Yes. And yet we want we want this marvelous <laughs> feeling of homeless. You also say whether this feeling of wholeness is static. What's that? You also say that when the mind is not occupied, either in becoming or any, in any other sense, whether that feeling is static. He's static. Find out. Well, my immediate response is that even for a split second, I get this feeling of wholeness. Immediately. I'm just a minute. Because we've talked about it, or is it actuality? It is an actuality. Wait, wait, sir. Be clear, be clear. Be careful. Because that Mrs. Porter is sorry, talked about whole, being whole and marvelous feeling of it. That, that very verbalization has helped me to capture something through the words. Be careful. It's not an actuality. Well, you reach a stage whereby you cannot believe yourself either way. Huh? You, you can be in a position whereby you, are, you can doubt yourself endlessly. Sir, look, we started asking, why are we so occupied with so many things? Because when we are so occupied, there is no space. Right? I mean, no freedom in mind is turning over, chattering away by itself. There is no freedom. And one asks, why can't it, why does it stop? of being occupied, that's all. Something must follow that, sir. Huh? These moments, these moments of freedom from the known, these epiphanies, these, these moments of perception, must then lead on to something. They, they, it they, does. They form a new conditioning. In oh, it does. And this, this new, we've, we've been talking about states of being all this time, but being must lead to doing. Uh, and there, there, perhaps, is the, the root of change. It's Even the world, sir. These moments I know. If the universe has no cause for existence, why should we have cause? I don't really see it. Thank <laughs> you. 